a frantic expression of grief. Uh, thank you very much um, for the introduction. It's, it's a great pleasure and a distinct honor uh, to be here in front of you. Um, and I think I must begin with appreciation for the organizers um, who have done a tremendous job by inviting people, organizing this event, inviting scholars from all over the world, and, and they deserve our recognition. Um, I have many names in mind, but Dr. Sham Abidi, um, Dr. Pravez Shah, Mr. Asad Sadiq, um, their leadership has provided us this opportunity um, to have this platform where we can discuss um, all the issues related to the Muslim world. What was said moments ago was so critical. Indeed, there are very few Muslims here. Uh, indeed, there are very few non-Muslims here. But the nature of discourse and the nature of challenge faced by the Muslim world, whether it is in the Muslim majority countries or for Muslims in the West, it has become so serious that it has internal dimensions as well. And that's what I look forward to, to explain the dynamic, to, to analyze those things for you. Let me first very clearly explain the topic and tell you the plan in a way in next 20 minutes or so, I'll try to analyze all those issues. The topic that was given to me was, who are the victims of terrorism? A historical perspective. And what I plan to do is first to explain to you what do we really mean by terrorism. And when I was um, introduced also as an expert on terrorism, um, th that becomes problematic at times as well when as, um, as an immigrant, you go through any of the Western countries and, and you are at the airport for immigration and they ask you, so what do you do? And you say, I'm a professor. Professor of what? Professor of terrorism. And there's immediately a first jerk and, and response. So, so what do you mean, really mean by that? It's because this is unexpected in various ways as well. Um, that even there are Muslims who, who are experts on these issues as well. So what I'll do in the beginning is to define the term terrorism, what we really mean by it. Secondly, I'll try to explain how was this phenomena of terrorism got entrenched? What were the tools which were used? Because we must understand those core techniques which were used. And I have absolutely no intention of telling you how the militant groups organized, what theology they used. But I, there are some core principles, what motivates terrorists. To understand who are the victims, we must understand who are the perpetrators. What is their line of thinking? What is their mindset? So that will be the next point. And finally, I'll talk about, um, so what is the prevention? What is the resolution? And not necessarily as purely as a political scientist, but in terms of the religious ideology, in terms of what the religious principles tell us. Because often in political science terms, we argue terrorism is a phenomena which is very complicated and very complex. Um, so often, this is the phrase which we used, which we use in political science when we want to say, uh, well, there is no real clear solution to this. So another way to say there is no solution, another way to say this is um, very confused is to say it is complicated. For Muslims, it should not be at all. So let me begin. Thank you for uh, your, your patience in hearing these introductory remarks. Uh, let me begin first with some very preliminary thoughts. There is no consensus, the worldwide, about how really to define terrorism. If you pick up the textbook, in the in initial part of my uh, lecture, I request your patience so that I can define uh, these parameters of my talk. There is no consensus about what terrorism really means. Is it only relevant to the individual domain? Is it about society? Or is it about state? If you pick up the textbook, it will tell you it defines terrorism as the unlawful use of violence to create fear. Unlawful use of violence to create fear. The immediate question comes, so what is unlawful violence, which means there is some lawful violence as well? And the related topic here is that we have defined it in legalistic terms in ways which is self-serving 
for country A or country B or community A or community B. So what I'll try to do is to come up with a different definition of, of terrorism um, and I'll include, include three or four major aspects to it. One, for instance, I, I agree absolutely, terrorism means violence, violence to impose your will on others by creating fear. It can happen at an individual level as well. Um, you're living in a state, your political opinion, your position on various issues, whether about democracy or dictatorship or religion, differs with the understanding of the state. So what happens? State goes after you in a very strong fashion to create a fear among others as well that please don't challenge. Uh, Bahrain is one example. Saudi Arabia is another. Where the state takes up this responsibility that anyone who differs with its, his, it, the state's opinion is declared a terrorist. There are insurgencies going on. And I'll um, remind you that most of these, or many of the states in the post-World War II, who were initially called terrorists, they were insurgents, militants, they were the one who were the harbingers of new states because they were the freedom fighters. So they, there's this one angle. I don't have conclusive answer to, the, to this, what, how we really uh, come down and explain terrorism. But these are the three parameters I want to talk about. So it can be at an individual level. It can be at the level of society. And here I'll give you examples, for example, the current day Pakistan and Afghanistan, where at times societal actions by certain groups will try to create, give the message that any challenge to these preconceived notions or these general parameters about how religion should be talked about, how uh, other varieties of the religious experience should be talked about, these are the ones which are legitimate, which are acceptable, and these are out. Whatever the state or the society also, the societal leaders, whether political or religious, as soon as they want to define or isolate one group or one sect, they also use this phenomenon. The third is, uh, the third parameter of this word or phrase or phenomena terrorism is state. Uh, states go and at times go for uh, conflict and war and the history of conflict and war is, is of course very old. But within that context also, occupation, oppression at times also is linked with the idea of terrorism. So these were just the general thoughts. But what I plan to do is to talk about the internal phenomena and to first answer the very basic question. So in this context of individual, societal and state level violence created to, for fear purposes, how do we really understand who are the victims of terrorism? I would argue in the present world context, indeed Muslims, are the real victims of terrorism at the hands of others who also claim to be Muslims. And that's the biggest dilemma. We often ignore this aspect. We often completely avoid discussion of this issue that how did it happen? Absolutely, we need to focus on the progressive elements, on the creative ideals of Islam. But we cannot continue to ignore that something has very seriously gone wrong within the internal Islamic discourse which has created so many of the militants and terrorists that they really believe that this is this art of terrorism is the core feature of religious tradition. So how do we go about that? And that's mainly my topic which I wanted to bring it down to this. Up front, I'll tell you my thesis and then I'll go and try to and divide it into diff different segments. My upfront, my view is that this terrorism phenomena within the internal Muslim world is very clearly a product of sectarianism at one level and a product of political battles at the other level and it uses three major, major tools. Sectarianism is what provides the space and environment for this terrorism to grow. Political battles explain the other pillar of terrorism within the Muslim world. The three techniques or th the three foundations of this form of terrorism are number one, hatred. 
you create hatred so that the person who really want you want to target you develop a hatred because then you you leave all humanity and i'll uh, mention this um uh, one video clip that i saw recently and you can also go to youtube there was a suicide bomber who was caught who before he blew himself up he was um, arrested in pakistan and he was brought to the television and he was asked some very basic questions um about and he was asked for example let's say there are three people in a certain group that you want to target and you want to kill them whatever your justification is but there are 100 people around that how do you justify that and he started quoting verses from quran the way he his distorted world view was that no it is absolutely legitimate to kill those 100 others surrounding as well so long as those three your to your target audience your target are are within that capacity they were also asked other questions about women rights democracy and this is exactly i'm quoting from that um in interrogation which was shown on television and uh, on pakistani television channel which is now on um, on uh, youtube as well you will be amazed by the dist- the distorted world view so hatred is the first phenomenon second is ignorance we we often think that if we are looking at some very complex phenomena something very big um we we avoid looking at some of the very basic factors education or ignorance is something very basic after hatred comes ignorance and the third technique which is used is shortcuts for political objectives so if i am clear to, to this stage the three techniques used by terrorists within the internal muslim phenomena is hatred ignorance and shortcut to achieve political objectives now let me go a little further i i stop did this argument here and look at the leading experts of the world um who have done work on it and i'll benefit from two and this is uh, two scholars who i want to quote and i would highly encourage you to read their books as well uh, one is graham fuller a former intelligence official from united states has published three excellent books one is on political islam his latest book which which came out actually very recently from which i'll uh, i'll quote is called a world without muslims and the second book that i want to use the, the graham fuller is now established as a leading political um, analyst who who talks about terrorism out of his own experience and his own uh, education as well the second book i want to refer to is douglas johnston um the, the title of the book is religion terror and error graham fuller says and i have very short quotations from them just just to develop my argument graham fuller says terrorism is one of the most vicious forms of politics by other means terrorism is one of the most vicious forms of politics by other means the other author douglas johnston says in his book which i just quoted religion terror and error he says power politics aids and abets conflict and terrorism now what i'm trying to argue here is political analysts academics scholars who have focused or who focused on this issue or spent decades working on this after looking at all the case studies of where terrorism is growing conclude that it is political grab a, pol- a political grab or grab for power or internal politics without any principles which also creates basis for terrorism and i have used these two definitions to make a point that let's go back to the question that i had raised earlier what explains some level of popularity for terrorism among muslims i'll use these two western scholars phenomena and my argument is that sectarianism right from the word go if not right from the word go within the islamic tradition then from its early years the the foundations of of sectarianism looking at it from a political angle created the space and how was it done and meanwhile keep those three ideals in mind which i had mentioned three techniques hatred ignorance shortcut for political objectives bringing it down 
to what had gone wrong within the Muslim world in terms of sectarianism, the first attempt that was made to distort religion was to start distorting Quranic injunctions or the message of Quran by targeting those very people who really knew what is the essence of Quran. Secondly, challenging the spirit <coughs> of a hadith also by concocting a hadith because by that you can just straight away challenge the core message there is one hadith for instance whatever that is i'm look, just looking at the phenomena you want to hide that one fact you will create 10 other hadith which will if may not take away that one major message but will create such an environment or create such a doubt that you might not be able to lead in it, lead in it, inside it. The third factor, expansion by force. And I remind you, I'm neither talking about crusades at this moment, nor I'm talking about um, the, the Jewish wars of expansion. We, we, we must focus internally to, to understand the phenomena. The wars of expansion started by, supported by, the Muslim world initially created an economic and political incentive for a community of people who, who were the beneficiaries in economic terms and they became part of that establishment which wanted the major religious ideals to be sidelined. I've explained this just to make my case that this phenomenon of terrorism and its support or some level of popularity today has not happened out of the blue. It is only those getting divided further into sects and by, info, by, by emphasizing that your sectarian identity is your real identity even as a preference to your religious or Muslim identity created that environment. I know I'm talking, I'm getting into a sensitive issue uh, and a controversial issue as well. Uh, but I, I think at least um, I should make that point to start that debate or discussion. You can have an entirely different viewpoint. Uh, but this is one way to look at this issue because this explains the foundations and the process by which the militants and terrorists today can really frame the issues as they want. We absolutely welcome Osama bin Laden's journey to hell. And maybe there are many more um, who we wish go to that path. But when I was asked by media uh, what I think whether terrorism has ended with the death of Osama bin Laden, my response is unfortunately no. And the answer is no because Osama bin Laden was not the one who created terrorism or who was the first terrorist in this context. He was just a tool or just um, played a role in one phase of that phenomenon. Now I want to come to the contemporary issue, uh, issues after just briefly mentioning this kind of <coughs> philosophical foundation. What entrenches this phenomenon? What supports this phenomenon in the modern day current context? My argument is, it is authoritarian regimes. It is oppression within some of the Muslim states. Unfortunately, many Muslim states, if I may correct myself, because that oppression and authoritarianism closes down the channels of communication and expression. When you close down, when you stop, when you create an obstacle for expression of your views, violence becomes a legitimate tool. So violence becomes a legitimate tool for your political objectives. All you need to do is to get a religious sanction and there is no shortage of distorted discourse within Islam which can very quickly be used to use for that political objective. That's exactly what, what Osama bin Laden did. That's exactly what militant groups in Sudan are doing. That's exactly what's happening in Somalia which was used in, in um, a part of the Eastern Europe as well which is now being uh, used in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, before my academic um, experience I had a chance to, to serve as actually uh, as a police officer in, in Pakistan. Um, and I served in the Pakistan-Afghanistan border region as well. And I can tell you, I, I regularly go to that region for interviews. The kind of commitment 
and dedication that you'll see and you'll watch and you'll observe from the terrorists some undermined their commitment their dedication um, is very solid they'll mention you five or six verses totally out of context and that what inspires and motivates them my point is when you ask them so uh, my dear friend can you really tell who is the religious authority who has informed you or taught you that this certain verse can be understood in this fashion and they would mention some unknown name or at times they will only mention my amir says and you you ask what is the religious education of your amir and they, they, there's no answer they, they'll just stop they'll cut you your argument right there it has also happened because of larger degeneration of religious political thought in islam we have divided our religious education our religious ideals in certain blocks in such a way that the broad message or the essence of religion got disappeared in the process and that that's my major point hatred becomes an effective tool it becomes kosher ignorance ignorance from all the worldly knowledge or the modern sciences took them towards isolation a very distorted view of the end of the world gave them the idea that by hook or by crook we just need to achieve that final global dominance phenomena and when you offer, offer what is the precedent they again have a very limited view of the initial years of islam so these techniques become the real model for these militants so coming to my the final points um, of my talk so now we know how got it entrenched in the modern world through lack of democracy through authoritarianism through lack of pluralism sectarian discourse and i am not of course nullifying all sectarian discourse but i am just saying there was a very good reason why in quran it was very clearly mentioned twice don't get divided into sects hold the rope of god and it was said at a time when there were no such divisions apparent also the very clear in injunction about who divides their religion and break up into sects are not part of the religious discourse there was a very good reason why these things were mentioned so now let me come to to the concluding part so what can be done about it uh, if we, you really agree with my philosophy or look look and look at other ways also to understand this is my humble attempt to understand what what went wrong within the islamic discourse so how to put it right first of course will be to shun sectarianism secondly i would argue that in response to those three things hatred ignorance shortcut to political objectives there are very clear three responses which islam provides us and yesterday uh, many of the great speakers who are also on on this panel they they had talked about this response to hatred is love it is simple common sense response to ignorance is education and knowledge response to those distorted political ideals is a patience for a certain process so that religious ideal ideals become obvious so the message of love message of education message of patience i would immediately link this solution or resolution of this stism phenomena with the three great personalities mr mudarisi who was speaking yesterday uh, beautifully talked about the the idea of love that emanated from our holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam i have no problem in explaining to this audience that the fountain of wisdom and knowledge within the religious discourse is the personality of ali imam ali ibn abi talib and there is no better example to explain the the greatest sacrifice and message of patience but to explain the sacrifice of imam hussein alaihi salam so the 
so at a philosophy philosophical level i'm saying the response to hatred and i had explained those phenomena i had established those based on on what what scholars believe in the field response to hatred ignorance and political distortion is love education or knowledge and patience so what will be the tools that you need to make that happen one very clearly in my assessment is education complete focus on education one of the pillars of this modern religious extremism if i may call that is coming out from what we call the religious centers there is no need for me to mention the countries or, or the places but maybe you go and just actually google wikileaks and you'll find uh, who was funding according to the to the western governments who were the people who were the countries who were, which were the organizations which were supporting some of those religious seminaries the only response to that is not by military might or not by military action but by investing in education the second technique which we'll use for this love knowledge and patience model is pluralism pluralism comes out of democratic discourse pluralism allows every muslim voice to be legitimate voice and also creates a foundation for any of these de-radicalization movements de-radicalization movements it is very easy for anyone to say let's call wahhabism or salafism salafism as the foundations of these pillars i am absolutely not suggesting that i must make myself clear if you challenge stereotyping of yourself as shia or as any other community also stand against stereotyping of any other muslim community no one complete community can be discarded or any religious tradition or sectarian tradition even can be discarded just because it is opposite to yours rather than any supporting military actions always support that religious discourse which allows you to mainstream the education and the principles and the ideals of elul bath if you continue to keep that message isolated among yourselves and the others create a certain image and completely isolate your discourse you need to come out of that box and challenge that and make your world view not a certainly a sectarian world view but your enlightened more open broad world view as the mainstream thought let me conclude by also arguing that what happened recently and these are really my concluding comments i am through with my time in terms of what is happening currently in the muslim world what happened in egypt in tunisia in bahrain i think is a fresh breeze of air and these are progressive movements irrespective of whether people who will come out of this process will certainly be um, like you or not this major movement for challenging authoritarianism for challenging oppression can be the can become the foundation of mainstreaming what, what i have been suggesting we as muslims living in the west i think are in a ideal situation to support two or three major things and with this i will conclude just the three ideas or the three foundations or of what you and i can do to make this happen one of course is freedom to think and cherish that because that's not happening so commonly within the muslim world and in any way that benefiting from the freedom of expression or this opportunity of freedom to think to transport that or to start supporting those muslim scholars without any name or any of any institution or any state but start supporting those progressive muslim scholars who have a broader vision that is the only way to challenge in my view the ideals of hatred ignorance with education and love 
Thank you very much for your patience and hearing.